Hello, sisters. Welcome to the Sacred Medicine Podcast, weaving powerful, soulful practices into functional medicine. Step into this beautiful space of devotion and explore everything from nurturing foods, rituals, sexuality, and awakening your innate sensuality. It is time to own your radiance. This is the Sacred Medicine Podcast. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I'm your host, Margaret Romero, and this week's guest is Robin Srigley. She is a, she's actually called the Hormone Diva. She's a holistic and nutritionist and women's health coach. She's also had her own journey with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. She runs a successful one-on-one coaching and online program where she uses diet, movement, botanicals, and self-love lifestyle to transform the lives of women with PCOS, endometriosis, PMS, painful periods, and much more. So I love this conversation today with Robin because we talk a lot about things that a lot of women have issues with, and that's PMS and how to alleviate it. That's one thing that you'll definitely learn in this episode and how to do it with diet and how to do it with just changing some things and adding some things and and maybe taking a few things out of your diet that really help. We also talk about, you know, the fatigue, that tiredness that you feel when you have PMS. So helping to eliminate that acne, also another one that I get from women a lot who complain to me. Uh, which is also super common. And then also P- PCOS. We talk about some things to balance your sugar, how to naturally decrease your testosterone levels. And then we talk a little bit about sugar cravings because I know this is a problem. Sometimes, you know, even I will have uh, some cravings for some decadent treats which I try not to deny myself too much of the time, but I also need to make sure that I keep those in check. So she talks about some really cool recipes on here. And we talk about brain octane, which I love from Bulletproof and so much more. So hope you enjoy and I'll talk to you at the end. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Sacred Medicine Podcast. I am your host, Margaret Romero. And for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. And for all of you return listeners, thank you so, so much. Today's guest is Robin Srigley. She is the Hormone Diva, a holistic nutritionist and a women's holistic health coach. Welcome, Robin. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much for connecting with me. I There's so many juicy topics here that I would love to cover today. And a lot of it has to do with, you know, PMS and that the fatigue that comes with it, also painful periods. I see this so much. It's so common, right? So uh, there's just so many things. Let's, let's pick PMS. Let's right. pick that first. And um, tell me a little bit about what women can do. Um, you know, there's so many different things that women have. They have emotional, you know, feeling a little low, maybe tearful around PMS time, or maybe sometimes angry. You know, you get that imbalance in the hormones. Um, and then you also feel really, really tired. So tell me a little bit, give us some examples or things that we can sort of do or change in our diet or things or herbs we can take that'll help to alleviate some of these um, symptoms. Absolutely. So I think, first of all, it's important to understand that when it comes to PMS and and other hormonal imbalances, there's like over 150 possible symptoms. So there's like a lot of stuff that we are dealing with as women, and it can get really overwhelming, and we don't know where to turn, we don't know what to start with. Um, So I want to start by giving some kind of really simple suggestions because obviously, you know, we all want to feel better. We want to have more confidence. You know, we want to have energy and we don't want to be 
held down or held back by our cycles. Um, so the first thing that I always recommend to my clients and the women who go through my program who are really struggling with a lot of symptoms and they don't know where to start, the first thing that I recommend is uh, getting to know your cycle a little bit. So doing some cycle tracking before you start diet, exercise, supplements, anything like that. It's kind of important to realize like, is your cycle healthy in the first place? You know, is it the right length? Do you have a nice um, amount and type of uh, flow? You know, what symptoms are you experiencing and when? And that kind of gives us a point to start to decode these things. And then you can get really a lot more specific with your, your diet and your lifestyle um, changes and shifts. Mm, great. Yeah, I love the um, cycle tracking. Do you have any special apps that you really love? There's so many apps out there, there right now. It's there crazy. Are. It's just exploding. I've tried quite a lot of them. My favorite ones right now, there's three of them. Uh, the one that I'm currently using is called Kindara. K-I-N-D-A-R-A. These are all free apps. This one I like um, because it gets really specific, especially if you're trying to conceive a child or to use cycle tracking as a method of contraception. On the other hand, because you can track your temperatures, you can track what your cervix is doing, you can track when you have your periods. But that's about it for the Kindara. But if you go for apps, either uh, I think it's called Glow and there's another one called iPeriod. Not only can you do all the stuff that's in Kindara, but you can also track symptoms. You can track your moods. You can track if you have acne breakouts, bloating, weight gain, low libido, all of this kind of stuff. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So, which is great. You can kind of just tick it off. Or if you use Kindara, you can just type it in the little journal um, part they have there just to keep track of everything. But I think it's really important not just to track like what day of the cycle you're in, but also to use these apps to track how you feel and what situations were arising during that time in your cycle and, and that kind of thing. So you can really get a good picture of so true. how it's affecting your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally agree. So what, let, tell me um, some of the things, like let's say, so PMS, so women, you want them to track their cycle. Mm -hmm. And let's say they have really painful periods. Let's take that for example. What mm -hmm. could some of the things they do or eat or, or take to help alleviate that? Absolutely. So being a nutritionist, I'm always going to start with diet. <laughs> I think it's just the very best way to start remedying your symptoms. And you can often, when you get really targeted with diet, see your symptoms kind of reverse quite quickly, which is great. And the first thing that I recommend when it comes to diet and trying to balance your hormones and and reduce your, your menstrual pain and anything else you might be experiencing um, PMS-wise is to have a blood sugar balancing diet. So there's a lot of misinformation out there and a lot of myth that we need to be eating higher levels of carbs like whole grains and we need to be lowering our fat intake because fat is making us fat and fat is giving us diabetes and heart disease and 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 causing us to gain weight and um you know contributing to all these kind of chronic preventable diseases but the truth is actually the opposite so this was based on some bad science from decades ago and finally i'm so excited finally in the last few years good information is starting to come out and and so when you have balanced blood sugar, and you're going to do this by having lots of fats with your meals, making sure you're getting enough protein, and then watching the types of carbs that you're eating and trying to go for like a moderate carb intake instead of eating like 20 sandwiches a day, for example. Right. And, and when this happens... Um, your ovaries are going to work better because insulin has a really delicate relationship with your ovaries. So if you have painful periods and your blood sugar is imbalanced, it's just going to make it worse or it could cause your periods to be irregular or super heavy. So it's really important to pay attention to this blood sugar balancing diet. And so I can say, you know, for days, protein, fat and carbs, that's what you need. But to give some more specific things that the women listening can do to actually make this happen. The first thing I always focus on is fats because we don't know all the time what the healthy fats are. We don't know how to put them in our diet because we're used to these like 
non-fat, low fat, like hundred calorie pack, like all this kind of crazy stuff. So it's a little bit foreign. So healthy fats that are really good to include and are perfect for balancing your hormones, reducing inflammation, which is a major cause of period pain, um, would be things like coconut products. So coconut milk, um, actual coconut itself, coconut oil, also avocados are fabulous fabulous sources of good fats for hormone balance, nuts and seeds of all types, whatever you like there. And of course, a lot of animal foods have fats that are naturally occurring. So if you're used to eating like boneless, skinless chicken breasts, eat the skin and you'll get some really good fats. Or if you eat beef, you know, you get some fats in there, different things like that. So those are kind of the main sources that you would want to start with versus like Uh, fried foods, which have like trans fats and really rancid oils that they're Mm -hmm. fried in and all of this kind of stuff, which is just going to increase your inflammation and your period pain and is going to mess with your blood sugar even more um, and create more of these problems and just kind of continue the vicious cycle. So making sure that every single meal and snack you're eating has a substantial amount of healthy fats in it is going to be the number one important thing to to make a shift with in your diet. Now, are you wanting them to just include like, what's the percentage, um, would you say that you're consuming then on a daily basis, or per meal? It definitely varies from woman to woman, but I generally recommend between like one and three tablespoons of added fat. I find that's a little easier than saying like count your, your grams or a fat or, or make sure you get like 35% or whatever the case may be. So trying to get a few tablespoons with each meal and also the timing of your fats matters too. So I usually recommend starting out uh, in the morning with more fats, less carbs. And then once you get sort of into the evening meal, dinner time, you can have more of those starchy carbs and maybe a little bit less fat. Because when you have that fat in the morning without much carbs or any carbs at all, it really sets you up for a good blood sugar balancing day so that your insulin is not going to be constantly spiking with your blood sugar and insulin um, once it gets high enough or you become resistant to it it's a fat storage hormone so women tend to get like a lot of belly fat weight gain and, and that just won't go away so if you kind of shift the timing and, and how you're composing your meals in the way that I've just mentioned it can be really really helpful yeah I think those cereals those morning cereals that are just packed with sugar are horrible they're really not good for you. And what do you think about, you know, the MCT oil or coconut oil in your coffee? That is um, like my favorite thing in the world. <laughs> I found out about this a couple years ago, like the whole bulletproof coffee craze. Yes, totally. Um, <laughs> now, while I'm not a huge fan um, of constant caffeine and coffee intake when you have hormonal imbalances, especially if you have period pain, big no, no. Um, you can do this with other things besides coffee. So I do it every morning and I make it with matcha green tea, which is like a green tea powder. And I put my, my MCT oil and, uh, usually ghee or butter if I don't have any ghee on hand in there. And that's my favorite thing in the world. It gives me so much energy. It keeps my blood sugar balanced. It, it basically gets rid of cravings altogether. Um, and it's really helped me to keep my weight um, managed uh, because when I first was going through my own hormonal issues, um, my weight was climbing like crazy. And so once I got it off, I didn't want it to come back. And, and having this kind of higher fat breakfast, like we're describing, has been the key for me. Now, do you add in coconut milk to that, to your green tea? Yeah, so I'll I'll usually make it, um, I make my own homemade um, non-dairy milk. So I usually make like a cashew hemp uh, oh, nice. every week. But mm-hmm. like, you don't have to do that. Obviously, go and get whatever non dairy milk you like from the store, almond milk, coconut milk, whatever. Um, and then I put in the matcha powder, you can mix it with some water. I just happen to like mine really thick and creamy. So I use 100% of the non dairy milk, but you could do half and half, you could do mostly water and a little bit of milk. But you definitely do need that kind of creamy base in there a little bit. Right. So all the fats will kind of blend in really nicely. Yes. And then do you put it in a blender? I have, um, I have one of those handheld immersion the blenders. Hand. Yes. It's the best. It's like two seconds to clean, two seconds to whip up. I don't have to dirty um, a container like a blender container. Exactly. It's it right in the pot. It's so it's great. really easy. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I do have Bulletproof coffee. Uh, I only, I don't 
really do caffeine at all. Um, and that the one I have is decaf and I only really have it like twice a week. And I was thinking, well, what, what else can I have? This I'm not a tea drinker really. Like, like I don't need caffeine in the morning at all. So mm. I've thought about different ways of incorporating this oil into the foods that I'm eating. Um, in the morning. And it's sometimes it's hard. Like if I have eggs with, uh, you know, a side of like guac, then, then that's fine. And I feel very satiated, mm -hmm. but sometimes there are, it's like, Oh, what am I going to put the oil on? Or, I mean, I know to cook with the coconut oil and that's really easy to do, mm -hmm. you know, or even making the eggs with butter. Uh, but I'm not, sometimes it's hard to find things to put the oil in, especially if I'm not, I'm not a, a huge tea drinker and not really, um, that often of a coffee drinker, maybe once or twice a week, if that, do you have any other suggestions? I totally do. And I'm so happy you brought this up actually. Um, because I love this style of breakfast so much. And like I said, not a huge fan of recommending the coffee as a everyday thing. Right. And some people don't like tea, like you said, and or, or any kind of tea, whether right. it's black tea, green tea, whatever. And so um, I like to provide options. And I've played around with this myself a little bit. And, and so I've included all these options in one of my my 21 day program because I love these breakfasts. So one of them is to you to make uh, a hot chocolate. Um, so cacao powder, your milk, maybe a few drops of like stevia or your sweetener of choice. Um, no sugar, of course, we're trying to go low carb in the morning and then your, your oils and whiz it up and you can have a nice breakfast hot chocolate. Um, and the other option is to do it with golden milk, which has kind of become a trend in the oh, last right. year or two as well. So making some, it's, it's turmeric and spices and milk and, uh, doing the bulletproof with that is really good as well. Yes. You know what? You're right. I have done golden milk. I just haven't done it often. It's sometimes I feel like there's this recipe that I've seen time and time again that they want you to make like this paste mm. and keep the paste. And then all you have to do is add that paste to the milk and then, you know, whatever else you're adding in there. It just seems like I don't have time. Oh my God, I didn't make the paste and I have to make the paste. <laughs> so I, I just, uh, I kind of just do it all at once and it's not that it's, it's time consuming. I just need to put a little more effort into making that, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Like, um, but I've never are... done the paste. I don't think I just toss in some turmeric powder, some ginger powder, like cinnamon, whatever. I just put it right in the pot. I don't, I don't think ahead for that either. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So I'm sorry. Was there anything else with that? No, I think uh, we got across the main points, just really trying to, you know, time your fats right and your carbs and, and making sure that you you have enough fats in your diet. And that's going to make a massive difference. And I know it probably sounds scary to some of the women who are listening because we're used to low fat living and telling I'm telling them to eat fat and, and they're scared of gaining weight probably, probably. But uh, don't worry about it. I promise. I promise it will work out for you. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I also advocate for fat in your diet uh, compared to, I mean, first of all, it makes you, it helps you stay satiated for so long. Mm -hmm. And if people out there are looking to lose some weight, you really want to have more of a fat. I, I don't know if, I mean, have you ever tried a ketogenic diet? I have. I did it. Uh, I've done it a couple of times, like for a few weeks. Um, and I found it was pretty beneficial. Yeah, so a ketogenic diet is primarily, is it like 60% fat per meal? And then, um, you know, low carb, but there is, a, there's a little carb in there. Um, and obviously, there's protein as well. But you really, the focus is really on fat, correct? Absolutely. And so generally, you're trying to get under a certain amount of carbs, depending on like what web website you're reading, they might say under 20 per day under 40. Um, but that's not necessary that might be super low i find for women uh, especially uh over the long term super super low carb might just kick their adrenals into disarray um but i was doing when i was on it i was doing 60 carbs 60 grams of carbs per day or, or less and uh i felt great um i'll probably be doing it again soon just every so often just to kind of reset my hormones a little bit um yeah. reset my energy you know after some months of uh, mixed eating or whatever, I find that it's really helpful for sure. Did you find that you lost any weight from it? 
I definitely did. I yeah. definitely did. And quite quickly. Yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. I've seen that before also, uh, in my body. Um, the only thing is that, that I found because I, I I'm also about 80% paleo. Mm-hmm. I don't do really hardly dairy. And on the keto, it's like, I bought a recipe book and a cookbook and it was, there was so much dairy. Mm-hmm. And I started breaking out and I'm like, oh no, I can't do this. I just can't consume this. My body's really not used to having so much dairy. So that was the only, that w- I'm, so I'm looking for like sort of a paleo version of, of a, the ketogenic diet. Yeah. It's almost like you kind of have to make that up as you go. Cause I find the same thing. Like yeah. if anyone listening, they're like, oh, keto diet, and you go and search it on Google or you go look on Pinterest like 80, 90% of the recipes are going to be full of like cream cheese and milk and, you know, (laughs) you know, regular, like all that kind of stuff. And if you have hormonal imbalances, you, like you said, probably going to break out, um, might not be very good for your blood sugar just because, um, of the casein in there, the A1 casein, uh, and some other things like dairy. If you're going to do dairy, like it's fine in moderation, or if you have right. access to like raw grass fed dairy, that's amazing where I live. It's not legal. So <laughs> I don't ah. have that. Um, but if you can get your hands on that stuff and you want to include dairy and it doesn't bother you, then go for it. But yeah, like doing keto when you don't have dairy, you kind of have to I haven't found a whole lot of resources, honestly, of non-dairy keto, like recipes and stuff like that. It's more of like making it up as you go. Exactly, exactly. And just doing paleo, but adding more, way more fat, I guess. Yeah, yeah you know, sure. Pretty much. That's probably the best way. Mm-hmm. Okay. So let's see. Um, now, how about that fatigue? The fatigue that women get. I mean, we all get it like a couple of days before first couple of days of the period, you're just so dragging. What, what can we do about that? For sure. So obviously there's lots of different stuff and it depends on what the major causes is. So blood sugar imbalance is a major cause. A lot of women before their periods, their estro- or their progesterone is too low. That's another cause. Um, anemia as well. So if you're low iron, especially the heavy bleeders out there, Um, if you're anemic, you're going to be very fatigued. And then, you know, if you're just going too hard, like I said, with the cycle tracking and stuff, you might notice that, um, there are certain times of the month where you have more energy or you feel more like socializing versus other times where you might just want to curl up on the couch at home. And the point is to honor that, right? If you're trying to go, 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 go all the time. That's a very masculine model of, of living yeah. and it will burn you out mm-hmm. and you will experience extreme fatigue before your period. So the more you can kind of work with your body and, and plan your, your schedule as much as you can around those times in your cycle, um, the better. But of course it takes like a few, a few cycles for you to kind of figure this out. But once you get there, some things that you can do about the fatigue, the first thing is what we were just talking about. So blood sugar balancing diet, getting loads of fats. Um, another thing that's really helpful is, uh, making sure that you get iron rich foods so that you can kind of replenish your iron, your B12, your folate levels um, to increase your energy. So like red meats, make sure they're grass fed as much as possible. Um, Leafy greens are full of iron as well. Spinach, Swiss chard, kale, collards, all that kind of stuff. Great. Um, Legumes, beets, sea vegetables, all of these kind of things have really good levels of iron. And if you continually put those in your, in your diet, you'll bring up your iron stores and your energy will increase as well. Great. Great. I love those options because especially going back to about the cycle, I am such a proponent of this and I've stated this before in in different interviews, but yeah, when you're just not your hormones are, in flux, you are PMSing, or you're just a couple of days into your cycle, and you just feel really tired. Just honor that. You you do not need to go and do CrossFit. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? You do not need to go and do an hour of of um, spin class or Soul Cycle. Like, chill. 
your, your body wants you to rest and it's okay. And every month it's going to want that. And so every yeah. month in, in different times of your cycle, which is a really good reason why you want to be able to have an app and you want to track things like, oh, okay, on days 26 or 27 or 28 or whenever of, of my cycle, I'm always so exhausted. And so you know that you're definitely not going to be maybe not going to the gym that day or doing a restorative yoga class or gentle yoga or yin yoga, something to be more nourishing for the body because that's because that's really what it wants and needs at that time. So don't totally. push yourself. It's just yeah. going to make you feel worse. It's not going to get you out of that imbalance for the hormones. Like just go with the flow pretty much, right? Exactly. And like the more you ignore it, so like every cycle you're ignoring it and you're keeping going with your regular, you know, go, go, go lifestyle every single day, the more you ignore it, the worse it's going to get and uh, the harder it's going to be to reverse. So the more you can kind of just, like you said, just tune in, do what you, your body is telling you, you have to learn how to listen. <laughs> uh, the symptoms will dissipate. Yes. There's something else too about, um, we briefly, we really didn't discuss it, but about acne, you know, breaking mm. out. Mm -hmm. Tell me, now I have, you know, I've, I've helped women as well to get over their acne and bouncer hormones and things like that. Tell me some of the things that you do um, that you tell your patients, is it something that they're eating or a supplement they can take or what do you recommend? Absolutely. So I have struggled with acne my entire life, basically, like probably since I was like nine or 10 years old, like crazy, painful cystic acne. And it wasn't until I balanced my hormones that it actually went away. Um, but there's been a few things that seem to work really well. Um, so obviously getting that diet in place. So making sure that you're removing the bad foods and you're adding in lots and lots of beautiful, healthy fats and proteins. You're getting lots of nutrient rich and anti-inflammatory fruits and veggies and all of this kind of stuff. So the diet's key. Another part of this is, um, Many women who experience acne, uh, especially in their adult years, if it's located mostly along your jaw, your chin, your upper lip, maybe your chest and back, that's indicating high levels of androgen hormones like testosterone, DHEA sulfate. Um, so it's really important to kind of get those androgens under control. And besides diet, the, the best ways to help yourself in this area are to exercise regularly so that you're detoxifying and sweating through your skin is really important. And also exercise allows um, sugar in your blood to get in the cells without insulin. So you don't have all that insulin floating around. Um, so that's going to be really important. And then another thing that I find is a really common underlying cause of, of acne in, in women, especially around their cycles, is uh, sluggishness in the liver. So the more that you can kind of cleanse and detoxify and rejuvenate and rebuild your liver and also your gallbladder as well, um, your skin's going to clear up because that's your major detoxifying organ inside. Like everything that comes in your body is eventually going to go through there um, and it's really cleansing and trying to get rid of all the toxins that we face, whether it's pollution in our environment or some crappy food we ingested and everything in between and our our liver is going to get a bit sluggish so if you can kind of move that a little bit i find that that plus you know diet and, and exercise is is really really good for for acne i'm more of like an inside out type of approach when it comes to that you can use all the topical creams and masks and makeup and all that yeah, stuff in the world for but sure. It might, it might not work. It might not get rid of it completely if you don't do some stuff on the inside. Now, what are you suggesting for detoxing when you say a sluggish liver? Um, what are you, what do you suggest that women do then to help sort of their liver detoxify better? Absolutely. So you don't have to go on like any kind of crazy detox or, you know, fast or anything like that to get your liver moving. There's stuff that you can do daily to help gently move your liver a little bit. So a lot of it will come back to food. So there are certain foods that are really, really good for helping the liver. Things like uh, lemon, leafy greens of all types, beets are really good, asparagus, um, 
that kind of stuff, like those anti-inflammatory, really high nutrient vegetables are going to be very helpful. Garlic, onions, all of this kind of stuff to move the liver. So making sure you get a really nice variety of those types of foods daily is helpful. You can also um, start your day with a little bit of a tonic that will help your liver. So you can have like a cup of warm water and inside you can put um, the juice of a lemon or if you have raw unpasteurized apple cider vinegar, you can put in a teaspoon or two of that into the water, add a little pinch of good quality salt perhaps. And then if you want to go even further with it, you can get something that's uh, called MSM powder, which is really, really helpful for the liver. And so you can put a little bit of that in your morning tonic to, to kind of help move things along. Um, beyond those kind of diet things, uh, exercise, of course, is really going to be important. Um, you can do detox baths. Uh, you can do castor oil packs over your liver. Um, you can do rebounding, which is like jumping on those little trampolines, yeah, like yeah. anything like that to kind of get stuff, you know, body fluids, blood, lymph, all that kind of stuff moving is really going to be helpful for your liver. And of course, you can do supplements too. Like there's lots of different herbal formulas for liver health out there and like vitamin mineral formulas for liver health. So if you want to kind of go deeper, you can always uh, do that as well. You know what I really love? Um and I've been actually doing it myself, are infrared saunas. Mm. Uh, I just love those. And I know that sometimes those are hard to find, um, to be able to find one. And sometimes people buy them and have them in their home. Or um, they have these um, bio mats. Have you seen those? They're, they're these mats that you lay on and it so you don't have to actually go anywhere. You can have one at home and you can, there's ones for the chair. There's also ones that you can lay on that are infrared and, and that heat helps to penetrate your body and it's a great detoxifier. But mm -hmm. something else that you mentioned too um, about even exercising and I think sweating and even like sitting in a, um, a steam room, if your gym has like steam or if a spa that you know of has a steam room. I love steam. I love sweating my ass off. Mm -hmm. So, which is why I do hot yoga um, four or five days a week is because I'm just dripping wet as I come out. And I love that. I, that is one of the biggest things I think for helping to detoxify. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I love the infrared saunas. I'm actually going for one next weekend. <laughs> oh, nice. There's a lady that I see uh, sometimes for shiatsu massage. She has a she has a sauna in her in her little clinic as well. So I'm gonna be I go there every once in a while and do a couple saunas. It's always so so nice. So nice, so worth it. It's it's really beneficial if you can get you know your hand if you can get your hands on a place that has one or consider getting like a biomat. If you know, I mean, obviously every day we need to detoxify because literally environmental toxins, things that are just in the air, you know, we're always being bombarded and our liver is constantly working. So however way we can make it a little bit easier, um, getting your sweat on is huge. Um, just not doing it around the time of having like your period or your cycle. So not to stress your body even more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, that was good. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, yes. The other one, the other last thing that I wanted to talk to you about was PCOS. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of this also, we probably touched upon a lot of this because uh, women's with, so PCOS is polycystic ovarian syndrome. And with this come lots of different symptoms. And I see this also, it's very common for women to come to see me. Um, they tend to have acne, sometimes facial hair. Um, they do mm, occasionally will have also multiple cysts in their ovaries. And sometimes it can also make them have a hard time getting pregnant as well. So tell me, and, and they're also tend to be a little overweight and sometimes have metabolic syndrome. So tell me a little bit about PCOS and did I miss any symptoms that are major? Cause you can. No, those, that's pretty much the main ones. Also hair loss. I don't think you mentioned oh, that. Oh yes. Yeah. Hair right. loss on the head. Yeah. 
Yeah. As a woman, I have PCOS. So as a woman been, who's been living with this for, I'm pretty sure it happened like right away at puberty, but I wasn't actually diagnosed until I was in my early twenties. Um, but after dealing with this for, for a long time, uh, I've come to realize that first of all, a lot of women who are diagnosed with PCOS still have no idea what the condition is and their doctors are not helpful. The doctors say, you have PCOS, you need to be on birth control yes. and mm -hmm. possibly metformin or spironolactone, two really popular medications as well for PCOS because um, they help with the androgens and the blood sugar balance and, totally. and the weight loss. Yeah. Um, and so they take these medications because they think it's their only option and then they have loads of side effects, especially that metformin is just insane. Um, and, and they don't know what to do. Their, their doctors say, you have to lose weight, but they don't tell them how. And so they try, um, you know, your typical like calorie counting, cardio session type stuff or weight loss and it doesn't work and, and then they can't get pregnant and then they're like 35, 40 and they're in tears because they haven't had any kids and they don't understand what's going on in their body, mm -hmm. um, which is really unfortunate. So I'm always trying to kind of give some good examples of how you can deal with it. And a lot of what we've been talking about for PMS or period pain is going to do the same thing for PCOS, the blood sugar balancing diet. Um, PCOS is a metabolic condition really um, of insulin resistance. Even if you are not overweight, um, sometimes the insulin resistance can be a little harder to detect, but it's most often there. And so anything you can do to balance your blood sugar is going to be super, super important for PCOS. Oh yeah. Big time. Now, so I've seen high, high levels of testosterone and DHEA sulfate in the blood work when I test these women. Now, sometimes, you know, I have given spironolactone in the past. Um, I can't say that it necessarily helps to relieve a lot of their symptoms. What do you do to help bring down those um, high testosterone levels? Sure. So besides giving them the basics, making sure that they're eating a really good diet, the next part is going to be how they manage their stress. Because when we have a lot of stress and we have high or imbalanced levels of cortisol, cortisol is going to make our blood sugar imbalanced as well, which is going to kind of continue the vicious cycle um, of irregular periods, no ovulation, hair loss, acne, all of that kind of stuff, weight gain. So managing stress is the next piece of this. Um, but as far as directly reducing androgens, there are some herbs that can be really helpful here and some foods as well. So for example, um, green tea is one of them, also very good for estrogen uh, dominance. Also, uh, some other herbs, um, let me see, reishi mushroom has been studied to help with androgen. So that can be a really good one. You can mm -hmm. get different supplements with reishi. Um, saw palmetto is another one that's usually prescribed for men who have prostate issues, but it's, it's targeting the androgens and it does work in women. Um, or any kind of supplements that you can do to balance your blood sugar. So one in particular, that's a medicinal herb I love is cinnamon. Um, it's actually been studied for women with PCOS to help with their blood sugar, to help regulate their menstrual cycles and increase their progesterone. So that's kind of another way as well. The more you can kind of get your ovaries and your body to normalize all of these other sex hormones, um, then your your testosterone or your other androgen levels are going to naturally go down. I find like if you go for just, let's say, remedies to reduce androgens like Sapa Meadow, for example, it is a little bit more of a Band-Aid approach because you're still not getting to the root. So the the diet, the, the stress, the exercise is going to be first, and then you can kind of add in these other things as you need to. Yeah, I like that. Definitely. I think that stress management is huge. So that's also going back. I mean, any sort of stress, physical, emotional, um, that, you know, if you're a stressful job or, um, you know, if you're living in a home where things, there's conflict a lot, I think that definitely does a number on, on your adrenals, your cortisol is kicking in a lot. And also, working out when you really shouldn't be and you should be right. I mean, I think that that's mm -hmm. just if you're overdoing it and pushing your body too much and too hard or doing a CrossFit when your body's like, okay, I can't do this right now. Like, can we just bump it down a notch? 
I think that when you when we talk about stress, we're also talking about the stress that you impact your body with when it comes to too much high intensity exercise. I totally agree. I think we kind of have this mentality of needing to like punish our bodies into submission, but it's just going to turn on you. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. So like, take it down. You know, if you need to, if you're not, if your body can't handle like boot camp classes or CrossFit or anything like do some yoga, do some Pilates, go for a walk outside. Like that's free. That's fun. You know, it's easy to do. Um, anything like that, you can still move your body, right? It doesn't mean that you're not exercising, that you're lazy, anything like that. You're just changing how you're doing it. Yeah, 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 totally. Now, we talked a lot about sugar balance. Though I've seen such, there is such a sugar addiction crisis happening. And which not only is causing obesity, it's causing diabetes and, um, diabetes and all kinds of other hormonal imbalances. How can, when you have someone that comes to you and, and they're having, they just can't get off the sugar or the carb. They're, it's just, they're, they're addicted to it. What are some of the things that you tell them to do to try to curb that, to cut that? Right. So I usually start with small steps when it comes to this because it can be kind of overwhelming at first if you're not used to and you're just kind of like a grab and go kind of person. As soon as you have a craving, you're hitting the vending machine, you know, stuff like that. So I always recommend starting with breakfast. I find that once you get in place a really good breakfast, one, you'll you'll likely just naturally change your other meals. And two, it will help immensely in reducing these cravings. I don't believe in willpower. Um, it really, it just, <laughs> we get those so down on ourselves, like, oh my God, I have no willpower, like I'm such a bad person, all this stuff. It's something happening in your body and you need to kind of correct that imbalance. So, mm -hmm. so doing the diet is going to get rid of those cravings or if it doesn't get rid of them altogether, if you have a craving for pizza or cookies or whatever, it's going to come into your mind and then you're going to be like, oh, okay. And then like a minute later, it's just going to be gone out of your mind. That's what I find happens. It's quite natural once you start changing your diet. Um, but for some people, they might need a more drastic approach depending on, on how you deal with, you know, 80, 20, if you can do that or not. Um, for me, I just give up sugar entirely except for special occasions. So my birthday, Christmas, like I'll have, I'm not a robot, right? I'll have some cake or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the rest of the time, I just, I just don't touch it. Uh, and I find that if, if I don't touch it in between those other times that I, I know I'm going to get it, then I'm fine. And I don't think about it. And I, I eat my veggies and my fats and proteins and, and I still make my food taste really good. I don't feel deprived at all, right? You have to kind of Find healthified recipes for stuff that you already love. I find that's right. a really good uh, strategy as well. Like if you can, if you have a favorite comfort food and you can find a really awesome, healthy way to enjoy it, then you're less likely to feel deprived or um, need to go, you know, reaching for that bag of cookies or chips or whatever the case may be. Yes, totally. I think a good breakfast, I think that is super key to start the day out that way. Um, especially if you've got adrenal issues or low adrenal insufficiency, starting the day, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, no, I'm going to do some intermittent fasting. I don't eat until like 12, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I have to do my 12 hours or however many hours of fasting. Um, that's really bad for the adrenals, by the way. And so making sure that you start the day with really good breakfast. And like we had been mentioning before, definitely a high fat breakfast, whether that's going to be something that you incorporate into your coffee, or like you said, you make uh, matcha green tea, and adding mm. some MCT oil or coconut oil to that or even butter or doing a combination of butter and MCT oil or butter and coconut oil, whatever, or with the bulletproof, um, what is that called the brain? Um, God, I use it every day. It's my book. Oh, is it like the actual bulletproof brain octane? Is yes, that what it is? Yes, yeah, brain okay. octane. Yeah. <laughs> so I've used that. And actually, I'll pour that on some things. If I'm eating breakfast and I have eggs, sometimes I'll pour a little bit of you know that oil on my food. Um, I've also mixed that with um, raw cacao powder. 
and kind of made like a paste and added, what did I add to that? Oh, I added um, some coconut oil, you know, when it gets really hard. Mm -hmm. um, or actually, I just found something at a store called Trader Joe's. We have a Trader Joe's here. And it said uh, it's coconut. It was coconut milk. But it said heavy, heavy cream coconut milk or heavy something. It wasn't just regular coconut milk. And so I'm like, oh, let me just try this. So I took like a big tablespoon of that with some raw cacao powder, mm. um, a touch of the brain octane oil. Um, I had like two cup, two drops of stevia chocolate and it tasted like a chocolate mousse. And right then and there, that completely satisf satisfied my sugar craving. It was so good. I have to put the recipe on on my website or something because that was actually amazing. I think there should be, there must be cookbooks out there that talk about high fat recipes, like high good fat recipes that mm -hmm. are for desserts only. I know. Totally. That, yeah. You know, seriously lacking. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds great. I totally want to make what you what you were just talking about. The this most similar thing I've made to that is um, chocolate avocado pudding, which is another way to get more fats. With oh, yeah. Dessert. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, we are coming to a close here. I can't believe it's already been close to an hour. Um, tell me, is there any last thing that you want our listeners to know before we end this call today? Uh, I think just to kind of repeat something that we've been saying over and over, just to really get it into their minds that the more that you work with your body, uh, the more that you're going to see improvements and there'll be lasting improvements versus when you are working against your body or trying to punish it into submission or just forgetting about it altogether. So, so tuning into your body and your cycles and your, your power as a woman really is going to be so, so helpful. Mm, I love that. I love that. And I've got three last questions that I ask all of my listeners. I mm. mean, all of my guests, sorry. Uh, the first one is what do you currently have at your bedside? A lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> always a glass of water and also my basal thermometer because I, I take my basal body temperature every morning to track oh, my cycles. Okay. So those are the two major things that are always by my bedside. Nice. Uh, what current, what's the latest book that you're reading? I'm actually reading one that is fabulous for the topic that we've been talking about today. It's by uh, Lisa Lister. It's called Code Red. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, and then it's all about like learning about your cycles and, and how you might feel during the different phases and how to kind of tweak your life around that. Uh, it's fabulous. I'm really, really enjoying it. Yes, I um, I have connected with Lisa. So hopefully she'll be on the podcast soon as well. That would be fun. <laughs> and let's see. What is another question that I can ask? Oh, what is one of your simple... Like, give me a, a simple pleasure, one of your indulgences that you just love, love, love. Mm, simple pleasure. I would probably say chocolate might be there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really good quality, like organic, fair trade, at least 70% cocoa. I really like the ones that have like a little bit of cayenne or chili spice in them. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. That's the best. I just love that. Isn't that good? Mm -hmm. So that recipe that I, I just made up that I was telling you guys about, you can add in, I put cayenne pepper in almost everything that I eat. And so that probably would be really tasty for you. Yeah, to definitely. Add some cayenne pepper in there. That sounds good. Do you also do your um, golden milk with something spicy? Um. I haven't tried putting in spice. Like I always said, there's always a bit of heat because I put um, quite a lot of ginger, ginger and also black pepper because black pepper helps with um, the absorption and utilization of the turmeric. So I always put some of that in there, but I've never <clears throat> tried putting in like cayenne or anything like that. Well, there's always a first time you can try that. Yeah. Especially definitely. if you're into spice. Mm -hmm. Definitely. 
Well, Robin, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. I love all of these. These are, you know, pretty, I mean, simple as in you can make some really positive food dietary changes to really impact a woman's cycle you know, to help with fatigue that comes along with PMS and help to alleviate like some of those very common PMS symptoms. So thank you for all this really great information. Okay, so why don't you tell me a little bit about how people can find you? For sure. So I'm all over the web, but my main hub is um, my website, www.thehormonediva.com. And so they can find uh, all my social media links there, blog posts about a lot of the topics that we were talking about, and other ways to get involved and work with me there. Oh, awesome. And you also do coaching and things like that? Yeah, I work one on one with women. And I also run group programs. And I have uh, a line of herbal teas for different hormonal issues as well. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So what, what type of teas do you have? Uh, I've got a few right now. I've got a detox tea, which is helpful for um, moving the liver and estrogen dominance. I've got one specific for PCOS, one for endometriosis. I've got a hot flash tea and, and one for menstrual cramps as well. Oh, my God. I love it. It's, what's the line called? Oh, I guess they don't really have a name. It's just under under me. I developed all the formulas myself. So they're the hormone diva teas. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, and then can people, do you have a separate website for that? No, nope, it's all on the hormone diva.com. So they'll find a, a link in the header there to my tea shop and they can check it all out. Oh my God. I love it. Okay. Awesome. All right. We'll have a beautiful weekend and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. I had such a great time. Thanks so much. Take good care. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed this episode with Robin. To learn more about her and for all the show notes, go on over to margaretromero.com forward slash episode 20. And if you have yet to pick up the free gift, go ahead and get that. It's at margaretromero.com forward slash gift. It's called Owning Your Femininity, Four Steps to Embodying Your Sensual Self. Okay, ladies, thank you so much. Many blessings to you, and I'll speak to you next week.